A 34-year-old man has been missing for only a few hours, but his family are immediately concerned. Their fears escalated when his car is found abandoned, suburbs away from his home. We found about half a kilo of cannabis. Nine spent 22 caliber cartridges were located. I did hear the F word being said quite a few times. I just thought it was a domestic dispute between next door neighbor and his wife. They actually had socks on his hands. They were trying to stop him providing information to police. We had a large number of suspects. He said that he'd had a, a gun held to his head. It was an indication that if he didn't cooperate, he could in turn end up dead himself. And the only way out of the corner was to tell us the truth. When a devoted father of two children went missing, police would rely, as they so often do, on the public to help solve the mystery. An addicted crime show viewer and a team of forensic specialists would find the answers to what was the most treacherous of murders. Danny Wosley's wife came forward and reported him missing on the Tuesday. He came from a close-knit family from a local area and his family were very, very concerned about where he may be. Danny's wife saw Danny with his best friend on that Monday morning. And they were on their way back from a, a local motorcycle shop. And arrangements were made for Danny to pick up one of their children after school from Danny's father's home. The fact that he hadn't picked up his son from school um, when he'd spoken to his wife that Monday that he definitely would pick up his son was out of character for Danny and an indication that uh, he had gone missing rather than just stayed out for the night. During the night, the family drove around a number of areas and actually came across Danny Wosley's uh, motor vehicle down in the shopping centre car park at Warners Bay. As police cordoned off the area surrounding Danny's car, they also inspected another vehicle registered to a man who had also been reported missing on the same day. It was known at that stage that Mark Banks was uh, due to appear in court on the Wednesday, following this missing person's report on the Tuesday. Banks was up for sentence for some 18 and a half kilograms of cannabis. There was no indication through the family that he'd skip bail. He had a partner with a small child that we knew that he had concerns for and part of the reason why he wanted to get out of the drug scene was that he wanted to provide for this child. He knew that he may be going to jail for a certain period of time because of his involvement in drugs, but he wanted to get out and clean himself up, so to speak. The result of the cars being found down in Warners Bay car park, we conducted a search of the surrounding area. We spoke to numerous shopkeepers and looked at CCTV footage that may assist us in tracking down their last movements. At that stage when they reported missing, there was no link to us between the two people. But no one recalled the pair, and neither appeared on the security vision inside the centre. The CCTV footage did not show the car park, and as a result, we were unable to get the movements of Banks and Wosley in the car park at that time. Police hoped the two vehicles themselves might provide some leads. At the time the vehicles were found, they were unlocked. Uh, there were no keys in, in either vehicle. So fingerprint examinations were conducted on both vehicles. And we were looking for things obvious like biological evidence such as blood or any damage to the vehicles or indication that there had been any signs of a struggle within the vehicles. But there were no signs of blood in or around the two cars. But there was one very important and surprising discovery. In a plastic bag secreted behind the driver's seat was located a sum of money, $4,960 in cash. We uh, dug a bit deeper 
and we went back and we spoke to the families and they confirmed that Wosley was associated with banks through the supply of large amounts of cannabis in the Newcastle area. Because of Danny Wosley's prior good character and reputation, he had a, a loving wife, young children, uh, lived in a nice house and didn't have any criminal history. It appeared to us that it wasn't something that he was involved in for, for many years. Whether it was a new enterprise that he'd gone into, that was something we looked at. And if he had only gone into it, you know, whether he wasn't quite wise to the, the dealings of some people in that sort of activity. It certainly made us more suspicious that this inquiry was going to be more than a missing persons report. Supplying those large amounts certainly brings a great risk to people involved in that drug trade and that we needed to act quickly and uh, look at interviewing a number of people in relation to their whereabouts as soon as possible. But by doing that very thing, the police would cause another crime to be committed. Police were currently interviewing all the relevant family and friends of missing men, Mark Banks and Danny Wosley. Everyone that had come up in our inquiry over the first day or two, we wanted them interviewed as quickly as possible to establish primarily the uh, last movements of Wesley and Banks. One of those people was Kevin Naismith, who had been with Danny on the morning he disappeared. His information was critical and needed to be put to tape. You agree that we spoke earlier this afternoon at your house and we asked you to come back here for official purposes, put this on, on record, all right? So, look, would you tell me what you know now about the person, Danny Wosley, and, and how he fits into the person, Mark Banks? Yeah, as we spoke of earlier, I'm going to probably give some information that I might even get myself into trouble, but it's a serious nature and I've got to do it. So. I've known Danny Wosley since I was five years old. We've been best of mates, that's been 25 years. Never had any falling out, um, been more like brothers. Um, Mark Banks, I've met Mark Banks on two occasions and they have been in the last six months. How they tie in together, it's through marijuana, um, the selling of quantities of marijuana. I, um, started selling uh, some marijuana before Christmas. So it was Christmas, just uh, December 98. Um, Danny recommended I could make some, some good money. Uh, so we did it. Um, any quantities I have bought have always been through Danny Wosley, who has taken my money and met with Mark Banks. Never been any problems, never been any hiccups. Um, yet again, like I said, this could get me into trouble, but um, I've been selling, um, on average, about two pound of marijuana each week. Um, because of the amounts and the quantities of drugs that they were supplying, they weren't your, your normal street-level dealers. You'd probably refer to them as a mid-level dealer, and then they, in turn, you know, sell to other people who supply street dealers. Now, to present day, Monday, then he'd come around my place at 10 a.m. Talk briefly, just about everyday things. Kevin told us that they had been together, but then he left him around midday that day to uh, meet Mark Banks to do a drug transaction. So I gave Denny $10,800 in cash, which was for three pound for myself. And then he told me that um, he'd come and see me uh, later on in the uh, afternoon or evening. And I uh, didn't hear from Danny at all, but I wasn't too concerned. Danny's a bit like me, pretty unreliable. Um, I didn't become concerned until Danny's wife rang me at I think about 11 p.m. Monday night, 16th of August, and she had heard or no sign of Danny. Did Denny uh, indicate where this meeting location was going to be? No, not at all. Not at all. So Denny expressed to you fears that he owed money around the town, as they say, or he owed a fair bit of money, yeah, and he needed right. to get a some sort of big deal going to pay him off. Yes, yes, yes. What do you, What do you think's happened to Denny? <sighs> what I don't know. Don't know. Don't know. 
I'm hoping they've just done something stupid and just taken off for a few days and they'll be back any day now. But to the same extent, it's a, it's a dangerous business and um, no, I just, no, don't even want to think about it. The information given by Danny's best friend was confirmation that the two men may have met with foul play as a result of a drug deal gone wrong. Then, an incident only a few hours after Kevin Naismith had spoken with police suggested they were not the only targets. Two days after the two men went missing, a large uh, garage fire occurred uh, at a residence in Charlestown. The garage was owned by Kevin Naismith. When the uh, police first turned up to the garage fire, um, Kevin Naismith handed them a note which actually had uh, the words, uh, be warned, you're next, written on the note. I was told there was a fire in the garage and my job there is to ascertain the cause and origin of a fire. During my examination, Kevin Naismith arrived at the premises and I had a conversation with him. He was visibly upset to a stage of even crying and he was very worried about his family and his friends. He told me that he woke to some crackling noises and he looked out to see fire within the garage. The garage had a main area at the front, which took the whole width of the double garage, and at the back there was a toy room, and on the other side was a storeroom. In the doorway between the main area of the garage and the toy room, I located a blanket on the ground after removing gyp rock that had been on top of it. This blanket had an odour of petrol, and it was laid out lengthways, which looked like a wick to lead the fire from one area to the other. There was a number of different areas on the concrete that had suffered spalling. Spalling is the cracking or crumbling of concrete due to the rapid heating of the moisture within that concrete and suggested that liquid accelerant had been either splashed or poured around the floor of the garage. Three five litre petrol containers nearby added to the picture. The fire at Kevin Naismith's place was deliberate. Our thoughts were maybe there are other people out there who have had involvement in the disappearance of Danny Wosley, mm -hmm. the disappearance of Mark Banks, and that they were trying to threaten Kevin Naismith to stop him providing information to police on the pretense that you know, he could be the next person that may disappear. Two men were missing, presumed dead. It was believed Mark Banks and Danny Wosley were meeting to do a drug deal and the best mate of one of them, who had spoken with police, now had been threatened and his garage burnt near to the ground. When Kevin Naismith was spoken to on the, the morning of the fire, he, he told one of the investigators that there was some men that Danny Wosley and Mark Banks had gone to meet and that they may have been behind the disappearance of Danny and Mark. But he didn't elaborate any further whether it was because he didn't know who they were whether it was because he was scared as a result of the fire and as a result of the, the letter that had been left. But with his best friend of many years um, having disappeared, if he had have had some information which could have identified those people, I would have liked to have thought that he would have provided that information to police. So the next step for the detectives was to go public and it drew an immediate response. The witnesses saw a man matching Danny Wosley's description walk down the driveway and enter their neighbour's garage. They saw their neighbour enter the garage and they could see to about chest height. And they heard the sounds of an argument. They then saw their neighbour come out of the garage. He went inside his home and then he returned to the garage and this time he was wearing different clothing. And what was also significant was at this stage he was in company with another person that they had seen at uh, his home on prior occasions. So we conducted uh, numerous inquiries uh, with other uh, residents. At that time, I was a cab driver and I used to come home for lunch. 
And I was just sitting there having me lunch and waiting for job. And all of a sudden I heard this very, very deep um, male voice, obviously uh, angry, and then a very, very high pitched voice. My wife eventually came to the window and sort of looked at me inquiringly and uh, I just shrugged my shoulders, you know, and, and about that, that stage, I'd say that started again. I didn't really know what the argument was about or I couldn't really hear what the argument was about, but I did hear the word, the F word being said quite a few times. And then I could hear banging, like somebody's been thrown against the roller door. And I think I heard it three times, the bang. I just thought it was a domestic dispute between next door neighbour and his wife. However, the neighbours who had originally responded to the public appeal were sure that what they'd heard was more than a domestic dispute. The witnesses are only a matter of metres away from the garage in their house when this was occurring. They heard further noises which they describe as, as crying or uh, a male you know, pleading for his life and words to the effect of, I didn't do it, no, please Kev, don't do it. About 30 minutes later, the witnesses saw a person get out of a blue Hyundai Lantra sports wagon and go inside their neighbour's house. Now, those witnesses were able to identify the driver of that vehicle as being Mark Banks. And they never saw Daniel Mark leave their neighbour's home again. Yeah, well, the, the neighbour was Kevin Naismith, and he was Danny Wosley's best friend. It appeared Kevin Naismith had killed his mate of 25 years, as well as Mark Banks, and it seemed as if he had help. Not only have we had Kevin Naismith at the house, but we've got this unknown second male person at the house as well. The neighbours had seen this man drive off in both Danny and Mark's cars in the later part of the afternoon. The male had gone for about 15 minutes at each time. And what was unusual to the witnesses was that on each occasion, he wore totally separate clothes. On one occasion, they actually had socks on his hands. And uh, it was as if this person uh, had never driven for the manual before, it actually hopped up the road. So frustrated away, we knew that this unknown person uh, had never been in those cars. Later in the evening of the Monday, the witnesses told police that they saw Kevin Naismith going into the garage carrying what appeared to be a blue tarpaulin. Um, he stayed in there for some time. Kevin. And the man they had seen earlier that afternoon wearing the baseball cap, he was back at Naismith's house. The witnesses had seen that person at Kevin's on other occasions, driving a gold-coloured Commodore. And from our inquiries, we were able to identify the other male as being Alan Faulkner. Are you uh, Kevin Nason? Sure am. Um, Kevin, I have a uh, search warrant here. Yes, to, sir. To uh, search your premises. Now, uh, I'll, uh, I'll show you the warrant. Do you have a, uh, a light here? Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. Now, <coughs> The things we're searching for are in connection with the offence of murder oh, shit. and uh, for supplying a prohibited drug. Yeah. You yeah. understand that? Yeah, go for it. Just uh, one one quick question. Kevin, do you have any firearms in the house at all? No. Right. No. At the exact same time as Kevin Naismith's place was raided, a similar visit was taking place with Alan Faulkner. Detective Dango coming to, please. I was given the prime responsibility of investigating Alan Faulkner. I've just found this um, bag on this bed containing um, a number of glad plastic bags, green vegetable matter in. We found about half a kilo of cannabis. Without touching any further, it appears to be 10. The underestimation of the position of the cannabis. Do you understand that? Yep. How did you get this cannabis? Uh, I drew it at once ago, about two months ago. Who 
I'll tell you that. Count away. Away. We also found a number of 0.22 rounds of ammunition, as well as clothing that Faulkner was alleged to be wearing at the time that he was at Naismith's house. I'm not going to inform you now that you're now under, the, under arrest for their murders. Um, you're not obliged to say anything further unless you wish. Uh, anything you what, do what say. Is that, sir? Well, just, just a moment, if you don't mind. Uh, now, you're not advised to say anything unless you wish. Anything you, you do say will be recorded and may later be used in evidence. Now, do you understand that? Yeah, I don't understand why, but... Kevin Naismith had been best friends with Danny Worsley since kindergarten. Now, he had been arrested for his murder. Can I contact my solicitor? No, certainly, by all means. Can, can you give me a bit of insight? Why? Well, once we get back to Charles then I'll explain everything to you. All right. What a jerk. Best friends on the bike for 24 years and they're accused of this shit. Kevin Naismith made a comment that, you know, that Danny was his best mate and now he's getting arrested for his murder. He, he, he didn't believe it. Alan Faulkner had also been arrested at the exact same time. The two men taken to separate police stations for questioning. The strategy involving interviewing each person separately was that uh, they weren't aware of the information we had at that stage, which had been provided by the witnesses. And they hadn't had the opportunity to you know, talk or come up with a story which may you know, rebut some of the information that the police had. So I'll take you back to Monday of last week, mm -hmm. the 16th of August. Uh, did you see Alan Faulkner on that day? Yeah, after... Jeez. Oh, no, I didn't see him on Monday. Tuesday, I seen her. Right. Tuesday. I did, I did go up to Kevin's that day. I um, think it was roughly around... I would have been around three to half past three, so I went up to his place. I was only up there for about 10, 15 minutes and I left. So you never saw Alan Faulkner at any time Not on Monday. last Monday then? No. OK. Are you certain of that? I'm pretty certain. I'm head spinning around in circles. Yeah. Move yeah. on. If I, if, I, if I can recall, I'll, I'll come back to it. Right. Firstly, we yeah. asked Kevin to recount his version of events and Tuesday. when was the last time he saw Danny and what he had subsequently done from that date. I think we just had a glass of Coke and he said, you'll have to give me your money. I've got to change your plans, I've got to go get it. Yeah. I didn't say much at all. I give him $10,800 and somewhere around 2 o'clock he left. Yeah, somewhere around 2. Uh, Once he'd done that, then we were yeah, able to put to him uh, certain aspects of evidence that we'd been provided uh, from those witnesses. And we've been informed that a person who we believe was Danny Wosley was seen walking to the garage at the back of your home. Yes, sir. I've been informed that there was some uh, swearing and that this uh, person who we believe was Danny Wosley say a number of times I didn't do it. Do you understand that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. uh, I've been informed that there was uh, another pause in the scuffling and then the person who we again believe was Danny Wosley say, don't do it, Kev, please. Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah. I've been then informed that there was six sounds consistent with something hitting something else. Do you understand that? Yeah. About a half an hour later, a male person who we believe was Mark Banks was then seen to approach the front door of your house. Do you understand that? <laughs> Do you understand yeah, that? Yeah, so I understand. Somebody's got it in for me, I'll tell you. Right. The neighbours were considered to be very credible witnesses. They had nothing personally to gain from providing the information to police because what they heard and what they saw was so out of the ordinary. They decided to commit that to paper. And they told police that they had seen on the Blue Heelers TV show other witnesses making notes, and they believed that that is the best way that they could record and remember what they did. For us investigators, having someone recount from their own written notes what they heard and what they saw on that particular day at that particular time was excellent evidence. 
But while it appeared an open and shut case in that respect, the defence team could easily argue that all they heard was simply a fight. So the detectives desperately needed to find evidence in the house and garage to back up their written story. We were quite confident that Danny Wosley had been killed in the garage, so therefore you know, a significant uh, part of the search was trying to discover forensic evidence to confirm that Danny Wosley had in fact been killed there. Two 22 calibre cartridge casings were found in the garage area, one on the lounge and one on the floor area towards the rear of the garage. We then identified five small holes in the rear fibro wall of the garage, directly behind over his rear fence and into the area of bushland, a large tree was identified and one lead projectile was removed from the trunk of that tree. Its size and appearance tended to corroborate the fact that we'd found 22 calibre cartridge cases in the garage area. So frost brand safe on the top shelf. In the main bedroom, there was a small unlocked safe and consisted of two bullets, one that had been fired and one that remained unfired. It appears to be a, uh, a 22 calibre Super X fired cartridge case. That was significant to the investigation because uh, Kevin Naismith had told police that uh, he didn't own any firearms at all, so it was an inconsistency there. Why would he have bullets if he didn't own firearms? There was a blue plastic bag towards the rear of the lounge room. When we moved that plastic bag, there was a single droplet on one of the slate tiles. The red droplet had the appearance of blood and a specialist forensic van, which was like a mobile crime scene lab, was actually taken to Kevin Naismith's house. So any evidence that was found was taken straight to that van and it was analysed on the site as best it could be. And later, we were able to identify that blood as being Mark Banks's blood. At this stage of the investigation, it appeared that Mark Banks and Danny Wosley had been shot. The, the task now was to find their bodies and with Naismith denying any involvement. Basically, it's all lies. All lies. Big time. Shit. It was time to turn up the heat on Alan Faulkner. Shit. A person fitting your description has seen to stall that car a number of times as, as it's going up Whitburn close. What do you care to say about that? Must be a lot of people like me around, because I can assure it wasn't me. On the very night that relatives had found Danny Wosley's car abandoned in a car park, neighbours of Kevin Naismith's had seen him and Alan Faulkner enter his garage with a tarpaulin. Now, a person fitting your description was seen that night about 9pm at the front of Kevin's garage with Kevin Naismith. What do you say about that? He's going to know he misses that. Sorry? I was at home. Sure, that's what you're saying. But you deny this? Yeah. The person was seen to drag a tarp into the garage and then the garage roller doors shut. Did you drag a tarp into that garage? No. So you're basically saying you weren't there that night at all? Yeah, I weren't there that night at all. Sometime later in the evening, the neighbours saw a trailer being backed up to the garage. And the next day, the trailer and Kevin Naismith were gone. Kevin was now being asked about his movements that following day. We were told by Kevin during the interview that himself and Faulkner went to the Williamtown area to do some work at a sand mine um, and that they'd stayed up there uh, for, the, for the Tuesday and, and returned home later that day. Who's your employer up there? Um... Bruce, I can't remember his last name. I can't remember his last name. That was just a cash in hand work and I, I declined to answer any questions in that relation for fear of getting him into, oh, right. into trouble via tax and things like okay. that. I thought it was bizarre in the fact that, you know, he's a man being you know, accused and questioned uh, in relation to two murders and in his own defence, he wouldn't nominate the name of a person that he was working for. And when he was asked about where he got his trailer that he allegedly used at the sand mine, the answer was the same. Uh, and which trailer did you use? The friend's trailer. 
What's your friend's name who you got the trailer from? Um, I'd like to decline that right. question. I don't want to bring any friends involved in okay. all of this. During the course of the interview, we were advised that a lawyer had turned up at the police station and wanted to speak to Kevin, so uh, the interview was suspended and Kevin was allowed to uh, get legal advice. Uh, do you wish to make a handwritten statement about this matter? About that evidence? Or uh, yes. That? Oh, no. All right. uh, and once he'd received that advice, he didn't want to take part in any further interviews. Very well. Alan, on the other hand, was still talking. He was prepared to show police where he and Naismith had worked together that day. Now, you understand you don't have to, but you're prepared to do that. I can't say exactly for sure where the exact spot was, but I can give us a rough idea. So he was taken by myself up to those areas where we met another team of detectives who had spoke to every sand mining company during the afternoon. And these other detectives put it to him, being Faulkner, that there's no way that he could have worked there because of their inquiry with all those companies. So straight away we could prove that what he told us were lies, which meant he was getting backed into a corner all day. And the only way out of the corner was to tell us the truth. Um, we got to his place, he said to me, can you do me a favour? Can you drive these cars somewhere? I said, yes. Did you ask him why? I just said to him, well, what's up? He said, oh, something's happened. I just need these cars removed for a while. Something about blokes ripping him off or something and to get back at him or something like that. What did you say? I said, oh, right, Adam. So you didn't ask him where the bikes are now? No, I didn't bikes? ask him no questions. Just go do what he asked me to do and be done with it. Now yeah, tell me exactly what happened in relation to the tarp? Well, when I got back there, had the trailer there and said, oh, I need a hand lift and a couple of things. I said, yeah, right, eh? And he opened the shed door and I saw two tarps there, long, uh, they were heavy. So we lift them up, put them in the trailer. There was a little bit of blood on the floor. I naturally assumed it must have been either something human or something else that was bleeding or dead or whatever. And um, yeah, that's all I basically know about. You say you naturally assume something was human. From the the size of the tarps. Yeah. Did you believe that there was a person inside? Yeah, I had a good, yeah, a good thought going through my head that that's what it was inside. Do you have any knowledge as to where those two bodies may be? No, I don't, unfortunately. If you did know, or at a later time find out, will you tell police? Yes, I will. At the end of the interviews that night, uh, Alan Faulkner was formally charged with accessory to uh, both the murders of Banks and Wosley, as well as a number of drug-related matters. He was bail refused and due to appear before Newcastle local court the following morning. The following morning, Alan Faulkner's conscience, or perhaps fear of going to jail for a considerable amount of time, made him contact police. He wanted to show them where the bodies of Wosley and Banks were buried. Stockton Beach is some 20 odd kilometres of uh, sand and rolling sand dunes. In some cases, probably up to 50 metres high and in some areas quite isolated. We arrived at this particular area and Alan Faulkner indicated an area of sand near the base of a large sand dune. On the surface of it, the area didn't look anything extraordinary. There was a, to his new bottle top, there was a cigarette butt, and there were bits of what appeared to be burnt timber. So it just appeared as though it may have been a campsite. But it was much more than a campsite. According to what Faulkner was now telling Detective Dengate, this was a burial ground. You said, he picked me up, drove up to Stockton Beach, we pulled up over on the beach behind the dune. We dug a hole to fit two people in it. After we dug the hole, we put the two tarps in it. They bury both the bodies on Tuesday morning and then cover it back with sand. We stayed 
up at the beach on my trike. Later on that evening, he returned. When he returned, he had firewood in some petrol. Would you agree he said that at the stage? Yes. Tuesday night, Naismith comes back and they burn the bodies during Tuesday night. The two then go home and Kevin Naismith is interviewed by police about his missing mate. Wednesday night they go back up there and they find that one of the bodies isn't quite burnt. What happened was the bottoms weren't burnt, so he lifted them up and I put wood under them. So then they actually had to prop the bodies up in the gravesite and reburn them during that night. Alan Faulkner also told police that he was left at the beach while Naismith returned to his home and deliberately set fire to his own garage. Uh, and from the information from Faulkner, he did that for the sole reason to get the police away from him. And he put the note there to make it look like there was another party involved in the disappearance of Wosley and Banks. My knowledge where I've put here. That area sort in there, around where that burnt stuff is. Police now needed to confirm whether the story Alan Faulkner was giving them was indeed correct. Police uncovered a grave in Stockton sand dunes yesterday, locating one badly burned body and evidence of a second. During the early stages of the excavation, we uncovered a section of blue tarpaulin. When we examined that, there was a section of rib cage that was found, as was a section of skull that still had some hair attached to it. We x-rayed the body inside the tarpaulin, which was subsequently identified as Mr. Banks, and we found one virtually intact bullet in the brain and the fragmented remains of a second bullet in the head. And the evidence also indicated that the bullets had entered from the back of the head. So he'd obviously been shot from behind and perhaps didn't even know there was a gun pointed at him. When police had dug out the wrapped remains of Mark Banks, they also discovered two further thigh bones above that tarpaulin and by taking bone marrow and comparing it with the DNA of his family, we confirmed that they were the remains of Mr. Wosley. With the discovery of the bones on Stockton Beach, the case for the prosecution was getting stronger. However, like the neighbor's testimony, Alan Faulkner's version of events needed to be backed up by science. It was essential to their case that Kevin Naismith was forensically linked to the burial site. At Kevin Naismith's home, we found a side gate had been tied up with a section of orange rope. And we had recovered a section of orange rope that had been wrapped around the tarpaulins in the grave. We also found a red towel in a laundry basket which had a similar appearance and size to a red towel that had been taken from the grave site. Clearly, the cigarette butt that I found may have held some forensic value, so it was one of the first things which was packaged and sent away for examination. The DNA on that cigarette butt matched the DNA of Kevin Naismith. So therefore, we had a direct link to show that Kevin Naismith had been at the burial site at Stockton. And Alan Faulkner showed them further evidence. He took police to another area, which was several kilometres from where the grave had been located, and indicated an area where a tin had been buried. What can you tell us about these keys, Alan? Uh, the keys that I used to start Wasley's car, uh, Ford Falcon. What well, can you tell us about those keys? Uh, they are the same keys that started the Hyundai. 
30-year-old Mark Banks and 30-year-old Danny Waisley were murdered in August last year. Their burnt bodies exhumed from the Stockton sand dunes. Mark Banks had been shot in the head. The official cause of Waisley's death unknown. Today, Crown Prosecutor Wayne Creasy told Newcastle Supreme Court Kevin Naismith killed the pair because he believed they'd swindled him in a drug deal. The Crown foreshadowed a secret witness who would testify that Naismith admitted to being ripped off in Sydney. Naismith said he would get whoever was involved. Faulkner believed that Naismith was going to square up with a couple of people for ripping him off an amount of money. Faulkner had given Naismith a baseball bat. And Faulkner was there to assist Naismith should anything go wrong in relation to the payback. Wosley and Naismith go to the garage on the pretense of looking at a firearm and actually do fire a number of shots out of a 22 through the back wall of the garage. Faulkner is in the near vicinity and here's uh, Naismith starting to boot Wosley up with a baseball bat. It wasn't too long after that time that Banks arrives at the house. Banks goes into the front of the house. Faulkner hears a number of gunshots coming from the house and then sees the body of Banks laying on the floor inside the house. The blood on the floor, the bullets in the safe, and later a recovered gun with a silencer were consistent in confirming that version of events. The evidence of Kevin Naismith's neighbours and the evidence of Alan Faulkner were very, very consistent. That air in there, around that stuff is. Now, if Alan Faulkner had never come forward with that information, you know, the bodies of those two men may never have been recovered, and that really incriminating evidence of the cigarette butt for Naismith would never have been located. In the end, it took the jury just two hours to deliver the verdict. Kevin Naismith found guilty on both counts of murder. Kevin Naismith believed he was going to take over the cannabis distribution and he killed uh, Banks and Wosley to send a message to a lot of other people that he wouldn't be messed with. Justice Dunford sentenced Naismith to 33 years maximum in jail with a 25-year non-parole period. As for Alan Faulkner... At that stage, I wasn't arguing because I thought that I'll be next. Agree you said all that? He was found guilty of being an accessory after the fact and was released from jail in 2002 and he himself became the, the victim of a homicide some months after his release. The families of Naismith's victims are still trying to put their lives back together. I still find it hard to believe that he'd do anything like that, but he has done it. Vic Wosley's son, Danny, had trusted his mate for 25 years. That friendship betrayed over Naismith's greed and need for control. I got a daughter-in-law and two grandkids. No husband, no father. I've lost a son. He's going to be free in 25 years. I'm hoping they've just done something stupid and just taken off for a few days and they'll be back any day now. But to the same extent, it's a, it's a dangerous business and um, no, I just, no, don't even want to think about it. Kevin Naismith will be eligible for parole in 2024.